Hey friends, thanks for joining me on this episode of The Liberal Black. I'm going to be doing something a little different on this episode. I'm going to be sharing with you chapters 1 and 2 of my semi-autobiographical audiobook titled The Tender-Hearted Black Boy from Texas. I hope you enjoy. Chapter 1 I think I was 11 or 12 when my mama packed us up and moved us to the cult in Pittsburgh, Texas. To be fair, we didn't know it was a cult. Before, we had been living in a little rental property in Hooks, Texas. My mom worked there for the local army depot, where she was the only woman on the construction crew. I can remember her hating that job, and she would often complain about the harassment she faced. And it was just a tough job to begin with. And it was the 1980s, way before the Me Too movement. My mom, by this time, had found God when I was very young. So young that I only can remember having two Christmases when I was maybe around six... Eight. So by the time we moved to Pittsburgh, Texas to join Sister Walker's church, a life in the church where we were darkening the doors of the church three times more a week, that wasn't even a crazy thing to me. The religion my mother found at the time was non-denominational Pentecostal. That meant no pants for the women, no makeup either, We couldn't do anything if it was not edifying to the will of God. No sports, no popular music. I love music, all types of music. And I can only guess what I might have been if I had been able to surround myself with music as a child. We did have the music of the church, though. Gospel music. Songs by Andre Crouch, Shirley Caesar, Hezekiah Walker, and the Clark sisters were in vogue and on constant rotation. And did I mention no Christmas? No Halloween? I don't know if my little brother and sister ever even remember having one. Sister Walker, the pastor of the church, was an imposing black woman. She had light brown skin with freckles and moles on her cheeks. She looked like the kind of person that could take you and me both out in a street fight. She had a voice that was somewhere between Della Reese and Red Fox. Everyone was scared of Sister Walker. And when she preached, the walls shook. Her stares could beam right through you and make grown men cower. But when she was happy, whether in Christ or just with you, her smile was warm and lit up the room. She had a great big smile with white teeth like Janet Jackson. Of course, this is before I knew who Janet Jackson was. I recall when we first met Sister Walker. I mean, we had already been to her church and seen her preach and been to fellowship meetings. But this time, we were in her home. It was a nice home that was neat, clean, and lived in. She had large, comfy furniture and a spacious den for TV watching. Her husband, Brother Walker was a dark-skinned man with a beautiful smile as well. And he was equally as kind and, and gentle. My mama's meeting with Sister Walker included a walk of the grounds. You see, everyone, well, at least 60% of the members of the church, lived on the land that had been donated by one of the members. On this strip of land, there were only three houses. The pastor's house, the Owens who donated the land, and the Barker family, who actually no longer attended the church. 
all the rest of the houses on the land were trailers or mobile homes. There was even a home that was a bus, a little mini bus that had been converted into a house. Literally, a yellow school bus. It was lived in by Sister Idella and her husband. I don't think I ever saw her husband unless it was coming in from shopping and I just so happened to be walking along the poorly paved road and I see him taking in the groceries into their yellow bus home. Our spot would be right next to the church, our trailer. And just like that, we loaded up our Cadillac and moved to Pittsburgh, Texas. Chapter 2 Stop switching. I didn't even realize they were talking about me. Why do you hold your wrist like that? I looked down at my arm, at my hand, that was hanging delicately from my wrist. I don't know. I knew. It felt good to let my wrist droop, to sashay from side to side as I walked down the country road with the other kids. I was walking the runway before I even knew there was a runway. But clearly, this moment was problematic for the children. I was about 11 years old, and it seemed like most everything I did was a problem for somebody. I was always getting into trouble for wanting to play with my sister's Barbie dolls, for my sister was about seven years younger than me, so she had to be about four years old at the time, and she had maybe three dolls, and she just ignored them. For me at the time, I just saw an opportunity. I took one of the dolls and I scurried off to my room before anyone could find me. When I had found the doll, it was naked, because my sister, being only four, had lost the Barbie's clothes. Well, this wouldn't do. I found an old sock, cut the toes out, and slipped the doll through it. I grabbed a rubber band from the kitchen and used it to form a belt around her waist. She was snatched before I knew what snatched was. But the hair and the makeup. I trimmed the hair with great care. But the doll ended up looking like a head had got caught in the garbage disposal. And the makeup? Oh, child. I painted her with markers so that she would have nice eyeshadow and lipstick. And she ended up looking like Tammy Faye Baker. God rest her soul. I enjoyed the process, but my results let me know that I did not have a future in cosmetology. I stashed the dolls away in my room once I finished. Yes, dolls, I kept trying, and as good as I wanted to be, I never got there. And when my mom discovered the dolls and asked, who did this? My brother was all too happy to throw me under the bus. Boys, don't play with dolls, my mom said. Leave your sister's things alone. I could hear this sentiment ringing in my mind as the boys were asking me, Why your wrist so lit? Why you walking like that? I already knew. Boys, don't do it. At least not like this. Our neighbors, the Joneses, were a big family. They lived in the trailer about one house down from us. They had a very handsome father that put me in the mind of Lionel Richie. The mother was a larger-bodied woman, but very pleasant. They had six kids living in a three-bedroom trailer. And it wasn't a double wide. We were still very new to the neighborhood and hadn't met many kids. 
I was inside getting some Kool-Aid and pretty much avoiding being outside when my mom had shoved me out. Go outside and play with the other kids. My brother was standing there with the uh, eldest of the Joneses clan, Mark. Mark was talking to my brother. As I got closer, I saw that he wasn't talking to him. He was teasing him. Before I could say anything, he poked him in the chest. Don't touch my brother. The words fell out of my mouth before I could even consider them. Mark was a big guy. Not fat. He was muscled. And for my age, he was huge. At the time, we were both in the fifth grade. And Mark was a part of a group of guys who had been held back. And all these guys who should have been in the sixth grade were in the fifth grade with us. What are you going to do about it? He asked. Hell, I didn't know. I hadn't thought that far ahead. Man, I'll spit in your face and you won't do nothing, Mark said. I stood there with a face that was, in my mind, stern and not taking no mess. On the inside, I was terrified and frozen in fear. Then, the unspeakable happened. This jerk of a kid spit at me. Puh! He spit. I didn't feel anything, I said. Mark was standing a couple of feet away. He moved closer. Puh! He spit again. I didn't feel nothing. I said even more defiantly. This time, he walked up to me and grabbed me by the shoulders and spit directly into my face. I felt the tears begin to well up in my eyes and Mark looked on at me with a great amount of satisfaction. I want to say I smacked him right in his smug little face. But I didn't. I cried. I cried and I ran home into the house to tell my mom. I recounted the story through tears. Sobs even. I knew that my mom would be marching down the stairs of our trailer to handle this bully. My mom pulled me to her, and I could see the anger in her eyes. This boy was going to get it. He spit in your face? She asked me. Yes, ma'am, I whispered. And you just ran in here crying? That did not feel like a question of support. Uh, um... I I didn't know what to say, because clearly I had done something wrong. Yes, I ran my butt in here because I didn't want to get my butt beat was clearly not the response she was looking for. You get out there and you handle that right now. By this point, my brother had faded into the background and I don't know where he was. I descended the stairs of the trailer headed to my certain doom. To my joy, Mark and his brothers were gone. I had been spared. A great feeling of relief washed over me, but I knew I couldn't go back into the house. She might whoop my butt if I came in there too soon. I walked down the street, Played in the wooded areas, waited till the lights came on. I was still relieved, but my relief would be short-lived, as this wouldn't be my last run-in with Mark. Let's face it, 
It is never easy being the new kid. The school was a brick tan, and as I approached the entryway, the schoolyard was littered with junior high kids engrossed in their morning rituals. Hey! Hey! A chubby-skinned black boy was standing there behind me when I turned around. Hi! I tried to be as bubbly as I could. I wanted to convey an air of confidence. I'm Alex. You're new here, right? Alex was cheerful and pleasant. For some reason, I just knew immediately that he was smart, too. Alex invited me to join him for breakfast. I was relieved and, uh, happy. I was worried I wouldn't have any friends, and here I was, on the first day of school, with someone to sit with. You may think he would go through the rules of the school and explain the cliques. You know, who's cool, who's the jocks, etc. No, Alex didn't do any of that. He spent all of breakfast telling me about him and his family. Our getting to know you was interrupted when Nancy, a pretty redhead girl, sat next to us. Next to me. Leaning in uncomfortably close, she said, What's up, guys? She was a heavy breather, and her breath smelled like Pop-Tarts. Nancy said her girlfriend, she pointed to a pretty black girl in overalls leaning against the wall with a group of pretty girls. She said her friend's name was Gwen and that Gwen thought I was cute. Then she took one of my French toast sticks and skipped away. Alex was oddly impressed and seemed to be happy to be in proximity to the attention. The next few weeks were peppered with Nancy playing matchmaker and insisting that I make a move on Gwen. Even though Alex was extremely nice, I was not connecting with the school or its students. I felt like an outsider, and not just because I was new. I missed the smaller town feel of Hooks, the town we were living in before moving to Pittsburgh. The day I gave in to Nancy and her insistence that Gwen was just waiting on me to make a move was a Friday. Nancy suggested that I write a letter. It was the classic grade school courtship note. I like you. Do you like me? Yes or no? In the middle of homeroom, I placed the folded note on Nancy's desk. She smiled and passed it on to Gwen. I was so nervous that I didn't even look her way. A couple of hours later, the bell rang for recess. I was sitting on the bench with Alex when one of the larger fifth graders, a guy from the pack of boys that had been held back from the sixth grade, approached us. Or, as I was soon to find out, he was approaching me. You write my girlfriend a note? His large frame cast a shadow from standing in the sun on both Alex and I. Huh? I was confused. The large boy, Hal, tossed the note that I had written to Gwen, crumpled up, and tossed it to the ground. And it was just then when I realized that Nancy and Gwen had orchestrated this ass whooping I was about to receive. Should I run? Should I stand and fight? I I'm sorry, I, I didn't know. It was the best I could come up with. Hal laughed. We both noticed the teacher who was, by instinct, wandering nearby. I'm gonna get you, fag. He whispered to me through clenched teeth. Hal ran off laughing. Gwen and Nancy, both laughing, joined Hal, and they walked back into the building. Sorry, man. Alex was shaken. We both were. The left backpack, to which Hal belonged, consisted of five guys from the fifth grade who should have been in the sixth grade and they were notorious for providing beatdowns to students that for the most part were unreported for fear 
or further beatdowns. I kept my head down for the rest of the school day. On the bus ride home, I breathed a sigh of relief. I had made it. It was a hot Texas day, and the sun was bright. I let the wind from the window hit my face and ease my anxiety. That feeling would be short-lived. Mark, the spitter, plopped down in the seat next to me, interrupting my solitude. I heard Hal gonna beat that ass, he laughed and pushed me against the wall of the bus. He was a jerk, but at the time, I still found him attractive. He was attractive and athletic. I didn't call myself gay then. I didn't know enough to do so. I didn't understand the feeling of arousal that I felt for this bully. The bully who had spit in my face. Hey, fam. Did you know that the Liberal Black Podcast is hosted by the Anchor Platform? Well, it is. When I started podcasting, I knew absolutely zero about what to do and where to start. But the Anchor platform has been so easy to use that I'm now entering my fourth season of podcasting. Hard to believe. Give it a try for yourself by downloading the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Chapter 4 It was my dad's weekend to visit. I use the phrase loosely. It had been at least six months since my dad's last visit. He was due to pick me and my brother up at noon. My brother was busy packing, excited about our dad's visit. I was jaded and had not packed a thing. He had stood us up one time too many. I had learned to not have any expectations where he was concerned. My little sister was too young to go, so she was whining about why she couldn't go to our mom. I was annoyed with everyone making a fuss about our dad's supposed arrival, so I left and took a walk in the neighborhood. It was hot and the sun was shiny bright. I decided to walk in the road because it was shaded, due to the large trees from the woods on the opposite side. The sounds of a lawnmower grew louder as I walked further from our trailer. Richard in a blue tank top, drenched with sweat. Richard Barker was 19. His family used to be members of Sister Walker's church, but for some reason broke with the church, but hadn't built a home elsewhere. I was instantly attracted to Richard. He was 6'2", with blonde highlights in his afro. He had a crooked smile and deep, dark eyes. His plump lips were darkened due to cigarettes, but he had an athletic build and a particularly high booty. I offered to assist him with his yard work, but was very grateful when he turned me down. I was even more grateful when he invited me in for something to drink. The sweat from his shirt was audible as it hit the kitchen floor. He stood in the door of the fridge, staring, trying to make up his mind. I sat at the counter, cross-legged, and with my chin resting in my hands. As I stared at him, it was a feeling I didn't know how to describe, a feeling I didn't have the words for. My mama is going to kill me. He had noticed the puddle of sweat on the floor at his feet. He took off the shirt to mop it up. Let's just say I was pleased with what I saw. His dark chocolate skin was glistening in the fluorescent kitchen lights. Come upstairs. You can bring the drink with you. Richard was already halfway up the stairs before I could make up my mind. I felt a 
weight on my chest as I followed him up. I was nervous. I didn't really know why. His room was messy, clothes all over the floor and bed. The weight bench in the corner seemed to be neat and orderly and well used. He tossed the shirt into the basket, slid it open the window, and lit up a cigarette. How you like it? he asked. Huh? Like what? I responded back as if he had asked me a very personal question. The church, he laughed. He was amused, I think, by my awkwardness. Oh, it's great. I was serious. It was great. He seemed surprised by my answer. Cool, cool. He took a long drag off the cigarette and blew smoke clouds out of the window. Are you in college? It seemed like it was my turn to initiate the conversation. Nope. Air Force. Richard flicked the butt of the cigarette out the window. Oh, that's cool, I replied. I didn't know what the matter was. I was usually way more comfortable around older people. But this guy? He gave me the butterflies. We should hang out, I said, almost confident in my decision to admit my feelings. How old are you? Aren't you like fifth grade with my sisters? He chuckled, but it didn't feel like he was making fun of me. By this point, he was sitting next to me. I could smell the cigarettes on his breath. I wanted to kiss him. I could feel the blood rush to my face. I was embarrassed, almost as if he could read my thoughts. It was at this point that I heard my brother calling my name. He was walking down the road, calling my name like a dog that had gotten lost. I jumped up. I I gotta go. My voice sounded flustered to me. Okay, let let me walk you out. Richard was still shirtless. I was still staring. I was almost trying to memorize him as if this was the last time we were going to see each other. The muscles, the curves, the moles, even a couple of scars. At the front door, he opened it, and as I left, he grabbed my shoulder. Yes, I said, looking up to him. I need that cup, man, he said, smiling. Oh, yes. Here you go. I had forgotten I was even holding the cup. No problem. He slapped me on my ass and closed the door after me. Daddy called. My brother's eyes were red with tears. He's not coming. We walked quietly back to the house, the trailer. I was sad for my brother, angry with my dad. But when I went to bed that night, all I could think about was Richard. Hey, fam! I'm so thankful that you've chosen to listen to the Liberal Black Podcast. If this is your first time, welcome to the family. And if you're a repeat offender, good to see you back, cousin. Head over to theliberalblack.com for more information. You can download this podcast on Anchor, Spotify, YouTube, and Google Podcasts. Also, check us out on Twitter and Instagram. I am Mr. Cleo, and this is the Liberal Black Podcast. Be encouraged.